Argumentation Ethics and the Philosophy of Freedom by Frank Van Dunn. Reason is an ultimate given, and cannot be analyzed or questioned by itself. Ludwig von Mises. No person can disobey reason, without giving up his claim to be a rational creature. Jonathan Swift. 1. Introduction. In justificatory argumentation, two or more persons seek to justify or to excuse a belief or action, to determine whether it is a belief one ought to accept, or an action one ought to undertake, or whether the circumstances of the case excuse a person for believing or doing something that is contrary to right, for example, necessity, duress, compulsion, coercion, manipulation. Philosophers, scientists, and lawyers, regularly and publicly engage in such argumentations. In fact, most people do the same at least occasionally at home, at work, and in clubs. Thirty years ago, Hans Hermann Hoppe presented the argument, that no justificatory argumentation can invalidate the principles of libertarian capitalism, because those principles are presupposed in every dialogue in which their validity is questioned. Moreover, no other ethic could be so justified, because justifying something in the course of argumentation, implies presupposing the validity of precisely this ethic of the natural theory of property. In this article I will focus on the argument from argumentation itself rather than on its implications for political economy. My purpose is to clarify the relevance of argumentation or dialogue ethics for libertarian theorizing. I will also endeavor to rebut some frequent criticisms of Hoppe's theory, but only insofar as they betray a serious misunderstanding of the argument from argumentation. 2. The Argument from Argumentation to understand the argument from argumentation, one needs to keep in mind first, that when people is told or asked to believe, or to say, or to do something, they are likely, and in fact entitled to question why, why they ought to believe, or to say, or to do it. And second, that an exchange of arguments is a justificatory argumentation, only if all the participants acknowledge certain facts and abide by certain norms. Norms that no one can argue are invalid, because adherence to those norms, is a necessary condition of engaging in argumentation. In short, argumentation does not, and cannot, take place in a normative void. As Hoppe puts it, any truth claim is, and must be raised and decided upon, in the course of an argumentation. And since this cannot be disputed, this has been aptly called, the a priori of communication and argumentation. Arguing never consists of free-floating propositions claiming to be true. Rather, argumentation is always an activity. It follows that intersubjectively meaningful norms must exist, which have special cognitive status because they are the practical preconditions of objectivity and truth, precisely those norms which make some action and argumentation. Hence, norms must indeed be assumed to be justifiable as valid. It is simply impossible to argue otherwise, because the ability to argue so, would in fact presuppose the validity of those norms which underlie any argumentation. For example, one cannot seriously make the argument, that one ought not to argue, or, that one ought not to take argumentation seriously, without destroying the point of making that argument. A dialectical contradiction emerges when someone states, you ought to take seriously the argument, that you ought not to take argumentation seriously. One who seriously makes an argument, in fact refers himself and at least the members of his audience, to the norm, that they ought to take their own and one another's arguments seriously, and ought not to dismiss one another's questions or counter-arguments without giving relevant, pertinent reasons for doing so.
Thus, when the claim is made that, one ought not to take argumentation seriously, and this claim is presented not as a joke but as a serious proposition for argumentation, then the opposite norm, one ought to take argumentation seriously, is in any case simultaneously posited or presupposed as valid and binding, and is, moreover, argumentatively or dialectically irrefutable. The point of engaging another in an argumentation, is to make him understand the reasons or arguments for believing, saying, or doing something, in such a way that he comes round to the conclusion, that believing, saying, or doing it, is justified as being in accordance with reason. There is no point in getting another to understand, why he ought not ask for reasons, or why he ought not answer requests for reasons. Indeed, what shall we make of the argument, here are compelling reasons, for why there can be no compelling reasons. Of course, there may be occasions when one should not ask for, or give reasons, for example in an emergency, or when there are other prudential considerations for not trying to engage another in argumentation. Nevertheless, the normative principle, that one ought to act in accordance with reason, remains intact, one is entitled to question whether the emergency or other prudential considerations upon reflection justify or excuse the action. It is also necessary to distinguish between arguing about principles, and arguing about particular cases, in which principles are entered as arguments, say, about whether lying in a genuine argumentation is wrong, and whether this particular man in these particular circumstances did wrong to a specific other by lying. In the latter case, one might for example want to inquire if the other, say, an agent of the Gestapo had a justifiable right to know where the first man's son, suspected of being a resistance fighter, was hiding. In our present academic culture, dominated by empiricism and tainted by its attendant positivism and scientism, prescriptions such as, be rational, obey the dictates of reason, or submit to the law of reason, probably sound archaic. Nevertheless, they are all argumentatively valid, and undeniably so, no compelling reasons can be given for not considering them valid. Even people who do not want to be rational or hate being reminded of such prescriptions cannot find such reasons. The best they can do, is refuse to participate in argumentations and restrict themselves to one or another variety of sales talk making appeals to the other's fears and hopes, their greed and vanity, instead of their reason. 3. Dialectical Contradictions and Dialectical Truths Hoppe's argument raises the question, which norms underlie the praxis of argumentation, and are therefore logically undeniable for any person who claims to take argumentation seriously. However, it is beyond dispute that there are descriptive and normative statements, dialectical truths, that are in any case argumentatively undeniable, and other descriptive and normative statements, dialectical contradictions, that are in any case argumentatively untenable, even if they are neither analytic tautologies or contradictions, nor empirically or mathematically true or false statements. Of course, not every argumentatively justified conclusion is a dialectical truth. Only argumentatively justifiable conclusions, that depend only on arguments referring to the nature and conditions of existence of argumentation, qualify as dialectical truths. I do not dialectically contradict myself when I try to convince my wife, that our goldfish is not a rational being. But I do when I set out to convince my wife by rational argument, that she is not capable of understanding or producing rational arguments. While asking and answering questions, and getting answers to my questions, I cannot without contradiction, maintain that I am, or my opponent in a discussion is, not an answerable, responsible person.
Thus, in any dialogue, the participants must accept it as a dialectical truth, that each one of them, is an animal rationus capax, a being capable of reason, a person as I shall henceforth write. Moreover, they must accept it as a dialectical truth, that they are able to communicate and argue with each other, and that each one of them is a separate person, capable of speaking his own mind and, unless specific sufficient reasons to the contrary are adduced, entitled to do so. The point of having a dialogue would be lost if one of the speakers, were no more than a mouthpiece for the other with whom he is supposed to be arguing. There would not be a genuine dialogue if the participants were merely actors, reading their lines from a script written by someone else. The very idea of a dialogue presupposes an irreducible plurality of natural persons. Thus, in our argumentation, neither you, nor I, can deny that the other is a separate, independent other person. Moreover, the participants cannot but recognize that they constitute a community of free, separate, independent, persons of the same rational kind. Freedom among likes is the presupposition of argumentation, and cannot be denied in an argumentation. It is a dialectical truth that, in the context of argumentation, logic and facts ought to be taken seriously. Any attempt to argumentatively deny, refute, or defeat that norm, would imply the appeal to take logic and facts seriously. Anyone who considered the attempt successful would have to admit, that the logic of the argument or the facts it invoked, are irrelevant for its conclusion. Similarly, it is dialectically true, that one ought to be willing to respond to demands for reasons or justificatory arguments for, and to accept rational criticism of, everything one does or says. It is a dialectical truth, that silencing an opponent, by forcibly gagging him, or intimidating him by threatening to inflict harm on him, or indeed on anyone else, is not a permissible move in an argumentation. I'll burn down your house, if you dare to disagree with me, or, I'll see to it that your children never get a decent job in this town is an illegitimate move in an argumentation, no less out of order than I'll cut out your tongue. Such moves would destroy the conditions under which argumentation can serve its purpose. More generally, it is dialectically true, that one ought to respect, the physical integrity of one's opponents in an argumentation not only their bodies but also their property everything they own, that is, justifiably possess or control, or are justified to repossess or bring back under their control. This is, of course, just another way of stating, the respectability of the condition of freedom among likes that I mentioned earlier. It is also a dialectical truth, that bribing an opponent, say, by promising him money or a lucrative or prestigious position, in return for him not asking certain questions or only giving desired answers, is not a permissible move in an argumentation. Such a move would vitiate the argumentation. It casts doubt on the opponent's motive in asking questions or answering them as it would be unclear whether he was engaging in argumentation or merely seeking to bag a reward. Evidently, persons, that is, beings capable of reason, ought to be rational is a dialectical truth, and our reason ought to be the slave of our passions is a dialectical contradiction. The above are examples of dialectical truths, or of dialectical contradictions, some of them descriptive others prescriptive or normative. Together with others, some of which will be mentioned below, they constitute what I shall call the law of reason. 4. Rationally justified norms. Clearly, engaging in argumentation, entails a commitment to abide by a number of norms, because any violation of or departure from these norms 
impairs and possibly even destroys the purpose of argumentation itself. These norms come into play whenever questions about the justifiability of actions of any kind are raised and submitted to argumentation. Any action, from merely holding a belief, to producing large-scale effects in the physical world, may be questioned with respect to its justifiability. If an action cannot be argumentatively justified then it is unjustifiable. If it can be argumentatively justified then it is justifiable. It is a dialectical contradiction to hold, that an argumentatively justified conclusion, is justified only within the context of argumentation itself, for example, that assaulting another person in the course of an argumentation is unjustified, but that assaulting him afterwards is justified, even if he has not done anything that would justify the infliction of pain or harm. Similarly, because bribing a person in the course of an argumentation is unjustified, it is also unjustified outside the context of argumentation. An argumentation that conclusively establishes that one is justified in claiming truth for a particular proposition, or validity for a normative principle, remains conclusive after the actual exchange of arguments has ceased. Of course, someone who did not hear the arguments may well reserve judgment until he has had a chance to evaluate them himself, but that too is an implication of the ethics of argumentation. However, a blunt refusal to accept the conclusion of an argumentation, and accompanied by reasons that purport to justify the refusal, cannot commit anyone but the refuser himself, and cannot be considered a justification in itself. A lazy skeptic can effortlessly respond to every argument with, I am not convinced. But there is no point in engaging a lazy skeptic in an argumentation. Moreover, Dialectical truths oblige, not just the actual participants in a dialogue in progress, but all human persons. Justificatory argumentation appeals to reason, not to subjective preferences or personal quirks. It is easy to refuse another person the opportunity to present his arguments, questions and answers, and thereby avoid having an argumentation with him. Nevertheless, such a refusal is not a conclusive rational proof that he is not capable of reason. A's refusal to speak to B, does not prove that B is beyond the pale of argumentative intercourse. Treating a person as if he were not a person, is not justifiable on the mere ground that one has denied him the opportunity to prove himself capable of reason. It is dialectically true that, in dealing with one's likes other human beings, one ought to presume that they are persons, at least until there is sufficient proof that they are not. The contrary presumption, that other people are not capable of reason anyway, is a dialectical contradiction, because it amounts to an opriaristic refusal to take their arguments seriously, it amounts to a refusal to even recognize their arguments as what they are. Arguments. The presumption of rationality is implied in the practice of argumentation itself. Obviously, the presumption of rationality is defeasible in particular cases. There may be occasions when someone is temporarily out of his mind or definitively loses his mind. Moreover, Every human being goes through a stage early in life when his rational faculties and his knowledge of the world are still insufficient to allow him to participate in argumentations. However, it is customary not to hold young children responsible for their actions, and customary to hold grown-ups responsible for their actions, unless the particular case reveals sufficient reason to think otherwise. Few people are inclined to question whether this is a rationally justifiable custom, and with good reason, I should think. If a man proves himself an animal rationist capax, by engaging others in argumentation,
then he is a person and ought to be regarded and treated as such by other persons. If there are norms that are undeniably valid for persons capable of arguing, and actually participating in an argumentation, then they are valid for all persons capable of arguing, even at times when they are not participating in an argumentation. Such norms are not like, say, the rules of chess that bind chess players only while they are playing the game. There is no a priori of chess to match the a priori of argumentation. The ethics of argumentation does not contend that whenever people are engaged in a debate, they have implicitly agreed to certain norms. To accept that contention, is to uproot the argument from argumentation and reinterpret it as an argument about a game defined by rules that the participants have agreed upon. If that were the case, then obviously only the participants in an actual argumentation would be bound by those rules, and only for the duration of the argumentation game. However, the point of the a priori and the ethics of argumentation is that in order to participate in an argumentation, people must accept the norms that are implied in the nature of argumentation. Whether an exchange of questions and answers is or is not, an argumentation, does not depend on agreement, implicit or otherwise, on an arbitrary set of rules, but on compliance with the norms which must be adhered to if the exchange is to be an argumentation. Unlike the rules of chess, which define by stipulation what the game of chess is, the rules of argumentation are to be discovered in the nature of argumentation. Similarly, whether A proves B is not a matter of convention, but of logic. To sum up, it is a dialectical truth that one should respect one's opponents in an argumentation as free and independent persons whom one should not even try to manipulate or intimidate with anything other than the force of one's arguments. Moreover, one cannot argue with dialectical consistency, that argumentatively unjustifiable ways of dealing with other persons, justifiably prevail outside the context of argumentation, those others might be one's opponents in a future argumentation. Therefore there can be no justification for having recourse to such ways of dealing with such others. In short, persons ought to respect their likes as free and independent persons. Whether or not this is the principle of libertarianism or libertarian capitalism, it is in any case the rationally demonstrable foundation of the classical natural law ethic, the normative framework, the law of reason within which natural persons, human beings, in so far as they are capable of reason, ought to solve their differences, disagreements, and conflicts. Within this framework, a jurisprudence of freedom can propose and critically consider ways in which people ought to, or may, interact in various sorts of situations, without violating the normative requirements implied in their nature as beings capable of reason. 5. Significance for the history and philosophy of law. A man accused of having committed a crime, does not prove his innocence by proving that he committed no crime during the whole time he was in court where his case was being argued. The point of the argumentation in court, is to determine whether some particular action of his, before he was hauled into court, was justifiable or unjustifiable excusable or inexcusable. If a man proves his innocence with respect to a crime of which he has been accused, a judge would dialectically contradict himself if he were to say, congratulations, but I am going to hang you anyway. After all, it does not follow from the fact that you gave proof of your innocence, that anybody ought to pay attention to it, especially after the trial is over. An agent officer, or magistrate in the service of the government might say such a thing without dialectical contradiction, but only if he makes no claim to do justice. An official condemns a man to the gallows 
having heard only the arguments and witnesses of the prosecution and having denied the accused the right to defend himself. There is not a whiff of dialectical contradiction there, as long as the official places himself in the realm of brute force or cunning manipulation, demonstrating by words or actions that he does not intend to justify his action. However, he would dialectically contradict himself, if he were to go on to say, that he has rendered justice and spoken truly as required by the ethics of argumentation. He would also dialectically contradict himself, if were to attempt to justify his refusal to justify his obviously unjust actions. Perhaps the greatest merit of Western civilization was that, for a remarkably long time, it accepted the normative primacy of reason in human affairs, as the foundational principle of justice. This was the paradigm of natural law, which, in the words of Thomas Aquinas, amounted to the recognition of man's rational participation in the eternal law. Few thought of arguing against the principle that conflicts, disputes, and disagreements, ought not to be settled otherwise, than by means of rationally justified actions, in accordance with rationally validated principles. Force, intimidation, manipulation and so on, may be excused on those occasions when they are used as means in ultima remedio to help establish or re-establish justice, but never when they are used autonomously to bring about whatever one can get away with. Thus, it was accepted, that there is a court of reason and that men should have, and organize actual courts of justice to help ensure that reason should prevail. The idea of a court of justice as an island of reason, where arguments would be appreciated on their merits, and where attempts at intimidation, trickery and so on, would be checked and weeded out, became central to the ideology of the West. Inside the courts, the ethic of dialogue or argumentation should reign supreme, regardless of how it fares in the rough and tumble of daily intercourse. Moreover, the findings of such a court, with respect to the justifiability of particular actions, should prevail over the emotional or calculated responses of those who witness or hear about them, at least to the extent that the court's findings are justifiable. Only reason can justify, and that reason, is not manifested in a monologue of one side's arguments, but in a dialogue, where arguments and counter-arguments can be evaluated in an open confrontation. Thus, it was taken for granted, that a court ought to hear all the parties involved in a dispute, and give them an opportunity to justify, or at least excuse their actions that judges should arrive at the truth of the matter solely on the basis of the merits of the case, as they emerge from the accounts of reliable witnesses, and the arguments presented in court by the parties to the conflict, and that these verdicts should have normative authority as long as they are not shown to be wrong. Whatever the degree of social, economic, or political inequality in a society, Respect for the process of finding justice, and a commitment to uphold its findings, were held to be the keys to freedom and justice. The courtroom should provide the conditions that make fair argumentation possible, equality before the law, and, via the practice of permitting the parties to call on advisors and advocates, even a rough equality of intelligence and argumentative skills. It was a great idea. But of course the powerful, the rulers and their clients, often enough intervened in court proceedings and made a mockery of the independence of the courts of law, replacing them with boards of officials whose main function was and is to see that their master's voice is heeded by all. The judges were replaced with magistrates. The jurists whose main concern is the knowledge and application of the principles of justice, were replaced with legists, whose main occupation is to know and apply their master's wishes, as these are revealed in legal edicts and codes. Nevertheless, 
Even in this day of rampant legal positivism, the ideals of justice still fashion the way in which those boards and magistrates present themselves to the public at large and to their masters. Unlike bureaucrats and diplomats, the magistrates posing as judges do not claim authority on account of their loyal subservience to their masters, but on account of their independence from them. Paying lip service to the ethics of dialogue and argumentation is vitally important for maintaining not only their position in society but also their status as possessors of a science of necessary things. While positivism rules the curriculum in the law schools, telling their students that only the law matters, and that the law is nothing but the set of legal rules, edicts, and decisions promulgated by the authorities, that other rules in the same set designate as legal, the schools never tire of instilling in their students, the sense that the implications of positivism do not apply to the magistrates and the advocates, they are being trained to become. Like scientists, they should be aware that they are supposed to answer to a calling that transcends loyalty to any social or political regime. Like scientists, they should feel entitled to claim immunity from arbitrary interference, admittedly not as a general human right but as a professional privilege. And like scientists in the age of big politicized science, they should not have any qualms about serving and assisting the powers that be, as long as the latter keep up the pretense of their independence. Albeit in an increasingly emaciated and perverted form, the ethics of argumentation still has a hold on the imagination as the bulwark of civilized coexistence, no matter how obscure the distinction between a scientist and a government expert, or between a judge and a magistrate, has become in public discourse. However, its force is sapped when the point of argumentation in a court, no longer is to reveal which actions are justifiable and which are not but merely to determine which party complied with some set of arbitrary politically imposed rules. Then, argumentation gives way to a contest, in which one legal mind tries to outwit his opponent, in a game that turns primarily on one's skills in combining officially recognized legal classifications of facts, legal rules, other legal data such as precedents and currently fashionable notions into a strong case. Similarly, the ethics of argumentation and dialogue loses its grip on the intercourse of scientists if convincing the authorities of the social or political relevance of one's research becomes a priority. The argument from argumentation is not a mere academic artifact without any practical significance. It underlies the Western tradition of the philosophy of law and its impressive harvest of principles of substantive and procedural justice, which command respect, even after more than a century of systematic debunking at the hands of scientistic positivists and others, for whom man's reason counts for nothing, and his voice vote for everything. 6. To argue or not to argue. With few unfortunate exceptions, human beings are capable of reason. Unfortunately, many people prefer not to upgrade to the condition of an animal rationale by accepting or at least striving to live within the law of reason. Many are opportunists, who appeal to the laws of reason, if at all, only when it suits them. For them, what is in it for me? Is a far more pressing question than what is the right thing to do? Consequently, they prefer to get by on the basis of prudence rather than wisdom, prudence controlled by reason, just as they would do in their interactions with animals and other natural phenomena. Nevertheless, few people can resist the urge to distinguish between right and wrong, and to claim justification for their judgments in matters of right and wrong. However, Many want the reward of justification without arduous argumentation and are likely to settle for prejudices rather than well-argued judgments. Many people would sooner die than think. In fact they do.
That is not a refutation of the law of reason, but an indication of man's imperfection in the light of his most distinctive faculty, reason. Consider Jonathan Swift's statement that I have chosen as a motto for this paper, no person can disobey reason, without giving up his claim to be a rational creature. It expresses a dialectical truth, reason ought to be obeyed, for one cannot consistently argue, that reason ought not to be obeyed. It also states an argumentatively justified consequence of disobeying reason, one thereby gives up the claim to be a rational being, for one cannot consistently argue, that one is a rational being, and reject the obligation to abide by the dictates of reason. Recall that Swift defined the human being as an animal rationus capax, not as a being that is always and everywhere, as it were automatically, in tune with reason, but as one for whom it is a matter of choice whether or not he or she will accept to be rational, to live or to strive to live, to accept to judge and be judged, in accordance with the dictates of reason. Obviously, it is physically possible for a human being to refuse to place himself under the authority of reason. However, he cannot without dialectical contradiction argue that the dictates of reason do not apply to him but only to others. The same holds for a man who wants to claim his rights according to the ethics of argumentation, but refuses to recognize the obligations it imposes. That too is an argumentatively untenable position. Men who refuse to be bound by the ethics of dialogue or argumentation, cannot hope to succeed in justifying that position argumentatively. Such people choose to act, and to interact with others, outside the realm of reason. Placing themselves outside the law of reason, the context where appeals to reason or justice can meaningfully be made, they choose to be outlaws. They not only give up the claim to be rational persons, they also free all others from the rationally, argumentatively valid obligation to treat them as persons according to the dictates of reason. The point is that whether or not one activates one's rational capabilities is a matter of choice. We can choose to enter into civilized commerce with one another, by accepting the a priori of argumentation, and all that it entails, or we can refuse to do so, and play the Hobbesian jungle game. Some will choose the second option, thereby waiving their rights under the law of reason, and justifying others to treat them as wild things, which one can try to manipulate, but with which it is pointless to argue and if they do injury contrary to right, justifying others to treat them as enemies. There is no contradiction in their choice as long as they do not pretend to be able to argue that placing themselves outside the law of reason is the right thing to do. Indeed, some people succeed remarkably well, in placing themselves outside or above the law of reason. Nevertheless, they their supporters, clients and apologists, cannot ever justify their stance in a rational argument. They may not care about that as long as they get their way, but that is their choice. It is not an argument with any rational force. Their choice to make themselves outlaws in no way invalidates the laws of reason. 7. Outlaws and the Presumption of Innocence Hoppe had no pressing reason to discuss the concept of an outlaw in the context of his comparison of socialism and capitalism. Nevertheless, the concept is essential for a correct appreciation of argumentation ethics. Not understanding this, critics such as Murphy and Callahan assume, one, that Hoppe's theory implies that criminals are self-owners who cannot rightfully be punished for their crimes because punishment violates their self-ownership. And two, that, if the theory should deny that criminals are self-owners, it cannot claim self-ownership for anyone. If Hoppe's argument doesn't prove that criminals own themselves, then it can't prove that non-criminals do, either.
since there is nothing in the argument itself concerning criminal behavior. Against Murphy and Callahan's reading of it, we must point out that the argument from argumentation, clearly distinguishes between persons who stay within the law of reason, and persons who avoid or evade that law. Among the former, self-ownership is argumentatively undeniable. Among the latter the question of ownership, let alone self-ownership, does not even arise. Of course, rational persons may be justified in using violence against a brute or a criminal, that is, one who is by nature or by his own volition outside the law of reason, incapable or unwilling to submit to the test of justificatory argumentation. The ethics of argumentation restricts the range of one rational being's lawful actions with respect to other rational beings, who like him accept that actions should be justifiable. It does not impose restrictions on what a rational being may do to a rock that threatens to crush his home, a bear that threatens to tear him apart, a criminal who tries to rob him. A thing that is outside the realm of the law of reason, or a man who makes himself an outlaw, say, by fleeing from justice or refusing to make restitution to those he has unlawfully wronged, is not or is no longer in the same position as one who continues to submit to the law of reason or as a repentant robber who recognizes that his actions were unjustifiable and makes a genuine offer of full restitution to his victim. Murphy and Callahan simply assume that bashing the head of an outlaw a brute or an unrepentant robber, is just as much a violation of an argumentatively justifiable property right, as is bashing the head of an innocent person or a repentant criminal. They are wrong. My argument here refers to the theory of crime and punishment implied in the ethics of argumentation, a theory that is familiar to libertarians. Its bare outline is as follows, suppose that one person, T. A tortfeasor, intentionally or unintentionally, voluntarily or involuntarily, caused unlawful harm to another, V. His victim. Then there is an argumentatively justified obligation for T. To undo, or compensate for, all the harm he caused V. To suffer. This obligation corresponds to V.'s right not to suffer unlawful harm from another person. If T readily demonstrates his willingness and ability to make full restitution to V, the two must rely on negotiation, mediation, arbitration, or adjudication, to determine how and when full restitution is to be made. As soon as full restitution is made, the matter is settled, and V has no right to demand or extract more from T. In particular, V has no right to punish repentant T. However, if T refuses to honor his obligation to make restitution, for example by trying to evade being brought to justice, then he turns himself into a criminal. Consequently, V has the right to enforce his claim against an repentant T, who is now no longer a mere tortfeasor but a criminal. Thus, we have the presumption of innocence, that is, the principle that no person shall be considered a criminal or punished as a criminal unless he willfully places himself outside the law of reason. Any animal rationist capax is to be presumed to accept the law of reason, until it demonstrates that it does not. However, one who does place himself outside that law not only gives up his claim to be a rational person, but every other claim as well that invokes that law, including claims to ownership or self-ownership. As will become clear in the next section, none of this implies or even suggests that claims of ownership and self-ownership cannot be justified within the law of reason.